the book of Hosea this morning. I don't think I've ever preached from Hosea, but uh, the Gospel Project series leads us to Hosea, and uh, we are in half, halfway into the series, and uh, we're probing deeper into the heart of God, how he pursues us. So we're reading from Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 to chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read these verses responsibly. These are, about, these are about 10, 11 verses, so let's read responsibly. You don't have the verses on the screen? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't understand. 1 to 2, one, chapter 1, verse 2 to chapter 2, verse 1. Correct? Okay, you need to re- open your Bibles today, actually. <laughs> Bring your Bibles to church. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> all right, thank you for uh, serving all the time for the uh, let's from the. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You can read from whatever version you might have this morning. Uh, chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name, No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horse or by horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, the, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. Children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up to the, from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Let's read together. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Amen. This is the word of God. Against sin. Sin is a um, you know popular theme in the Bible. It is decent, one of the themes in the Bible and against sin there is no master right nobody has ever mastered sin and you know conquered sin among humanity now I remember as a child as a youth person coming to church maybe dragged by my parents to church sitting in the pews uh, like 10 minutes five minutes earlier in the worship service and just spending some, some time praying because that was the only thing to do the music was playing you know, nobody's talking, so you pray. And whenever I pray, I'm reminded of all the bad things I've done this past week, right? Uh, in those days, my sins were, you know, fighting with my sister and being disobedient to my parents. And I repented wholeheartedly. I say, God, I'm sorry. I know this doesn't please you. I've wronged. I have sinned. Would you forgive me? Next Sunday, I come and have that time again uh, and start pray. And I close my eyes. I'm reminded of all the things that I've done wrong during the week. I pray for forgiveness. I've wronged my sister. I've wronged my parents. God, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me? Next Sunday I come, five to ten minutes earlier, I pray, God, I have sinned again. And this pattern goes on and on and on. I don't know if that's the experience for you as well. Later I realized, you know, I I kept on praying because That's the only thing to do when you're early at church. But uh, I felt kind of bad to God. If I were God, I'd I'd be sick and tired of hearing my prayers, his prayers all the time. Same sin, same repentance, no change. Very frustrating, you know. So I felt sorry for God, and I got tired of, of praying, but I still kept on praying, being the good, you know, Sunday attending kid and all. 
I felt like I was being kind of rude to God. I was being uh, so bold before God. And I remember I received Jesus Christ a couple of years ago. I was even baptized, and I promised to God in the baptismal pool that I would never sin in my life. Uh, you know, cute, right? Uh, and uh, I keep on sinning every day, every week. Yet I still went to church. No matter whether you are a little child or a uh, elderly pastor, we realize that we are submerged in sin. We constantly sin. We are people who smell of sin all over, not just outside, but uh, inside out. We're all rotten inside. And so we constantly pray to our Lord, would you forgive me? We, we confess our sins. Why do we keep on sinning? One of the things, again, theme of the Bible is sin. That's why we talk about sin this morning again. But why do we keep on sinning? Why do I keep on sinning? Why do you keep on sinning? If we're honest, we can say it is not by accident, right? Oh, God, I'm sorry, I just made a mistake. I totally didn't see that coming. I sinned. More than that, we intentionally sin. We love to sin. There is pleasure, instantaneous pleasure in sin. Even though we know it's bad, we do it over and over and over again. When you're weak to alcohol, when you are weak to, to gambling maybe, and you know it's bad for you, but your hand is already there on the beer bottle or can, you're already there, your heart is there at the casino, what, what do you call that? Something that you cannot stop. You're relentless in that effort. We call that addiction. In that sense, all of us are addicted to sin. Although um, we're all different levels on how to manage sin in our lives. We, if we don't think about God, if we don't have the Word of God in our hearts, we're fast, we're already there in uh, calculating what, is, what, is, what is, there, is there for me. We're always self-centered and not God-centered. In fact, we are the masters of our own lives if God did not intervene. And God would be like an accessory, someone that helps us, uh, not the other way around and uh, we would be in total sin. This morning, I'd like to ask this question. How does God seek the relentless sinners that we are? How does God pursue us? And that is the exact question that is raised in the book of Hosea that we are reading this morning. Uh, I want this message to remind us of God's heart, how God sees our sins, and how God has given a solution to this sin. Frankly, you probably know the answer already to this Bible question. But I pray with my heart, I pray with you, that all of us, this message would be afresh preached to, my, to ourselves to remind us of God's heart right now. Not just in the ancient of days, but right now. God's heart for you and me. Just to give you some background to this book, because it's kind of random right now, we're looking at Hosea all of a sudden. Uh, last week we saw another king uh, in Judah, southern Judah. His name was Hezekiah, and he did this uh, extraordinary prayer. And along his, along his side was the prophet Isaiah. We're looking at the prophet and king series, so there's always a king and a prophet. So uh, Hezekiah and Isaiah were the, the king and prophet in the southern kingdom. Now this Hosea is of the northern kingdom, uh, contemporaneous with these uh, king and uh, the prophet that I just mentioned. But it was, Hosea was the prophet of the northern kingdom, and the king was Jeroboam the second. To give you a more a historical perspective, remember how Ahab, King Ahab of the northern kingdom, and Elijah, they were confronting each other, and uh, Elijah won over the battle uh, that was between the Baal worshippers and God, right? 450 to 1, and it was an awesome, awesome victory for God. And 100 years has passed. 100 years have passed since Ahab and Elisha. And now we come to Northern Kingdom, Hosea, the prophet Hosea, and uh, Jeroboam the second. And uh, you might wonder, how, what is the state of Israel now? What is the state of the Northern Kingdom after 100 years? God has done amazing things in the Northern Kingdom. He said, prophet after prophet, man of God, and he is, the message has been preached. Has there been a revival now after Elijah, Elisha, and all these other prophets? 
after 100 years, what does the spiritual landscape look like in the northern kingdom? Well, instead of, instead of giving us a direct answer, the book of Hosea, chapter 1 and verse 2, gives us an extraordinary story, which you probably are aware of. In verse 2, it says, to, he's, God tells Hosea to go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom. This was an extraordinary request by God because this wasn't just anybody. He was telling Hosea, a man of God, this was totally inappropriate to have a, get a wife of whoredom. In fact, do we actually use that word frequently? Uh, somebody who would be uh, like a prostitute. Maybe not a prostitute by trade, but who lived a loose life. Maybe she loved to party. Maybe she loved guys a lot. And she lived a very loose and easy life. Why did God tell Hosea to marry such a woman, which got a lifestyle that God would not, definitely would not approve? And not, not only they says, not only marry this woman of whoredom, but also have children of whoredom. The reason was simple. It was a love object lesson for Hosea and for the people of the northern kingdom of what kind of spiritual condition state they were in. In fact, the northern kingdom had not seen a revival. It got worse and worse and worse. The Israelites, the northern kingdom, were in a spiritual whoredom. And God wanted to pictureize, visualize, an object lesson for them, how God was seeing their spiritual condition. And uh, not only in this picture in chapter 1, I'm going to compare it with chapter 2. It explains more directly their spiritual condition. In chapter 2, verse 5, if you have your Bible still open, um, it reads this. God says this. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread, my water, my wool, and my flax, oil and drink. God is saying that Israel has committed spiritual adultery uh, against God. In fact, she was going, going to these other false idols and giving them the sacrifice, the bread, the oil, the clothes that the husband God had given her. It was a to total betrayal of trust and total betrayal of love. Why is God presenting this case before the people of Israel and before us? If you heard a story like this, a scandalous story like this among your, you know, acquaintances, maybe a far, you know, somebody that you know, or maybe a, a close friend even, what would your response would be? That marriage is over. Uh, definitely it's going to end in divorce. There's no, there's no restoration here. There's no recovery. I mean... Uh, she just ran away with this other guy, and there's no hope here. In fact, that's what we would have thought as well. Why is God presenting this story to us? Maybe it's God's way of saying that he's done enough for them. He's uh, loved. He's done his, his portion, his share of, of, the, of the contract. And uh, she, Israel, was unfaithful. And so he's had it enough, you know, he, was, he did good to her, but she did bad to him. Maybe that's what God was saying. But in fact, that is not what God is saying. Why is God presenting chapter 1 of Hosea to us? He's showing that the Israelites, the people of God, are relentlessly sinning, and yet God is relentlessly seeking after them. He is pursuing them. Just as they are relentlessly running, away, relentlessly running away from God, God is relentlessly running toward God and pursuing them. I see this picture as like a uh, paramedic, you know, in an ambulance, right? Somebody is dying, somebody is in trouble, and the ambulance is behind you, it's coming for you, it's getting there to rescue you, to save lives. You know, uh, Last month, I believe, uh, the people from the fire station over here came over to do an annual ins inspection. They do that once in a while and to check if all the excess signs are lit, um, what, if the, all the extinguishers are working, and uh, you know, if you know, everything is all right for the fire code and all that. And as they were heading out, I, I thanked them. I said, when we're having worship on Sunday morning, we occasionally, actually many times, we hear your 
siren. And uh, although it's annoying, I pray for you, for that God would protect you, and for you to be able to save lives and the emergency would be extinguished. Um, but when we think about these sirens, when we think about these um, paramedics, these emergency situations, these ambulances, we are reminded that it is a sign of hope. It is a, a, si a, a sound of salvation for those who are in a fire, who, for those who are in a car crash and they're badly injured. When they hear the siren, it is a sound, sound of salvation for them. I pray that as we look into the back, the rear mirror, our spiritual rear mirror this morning, that we would see God's ambulance there pursuing us. We find the Lord speaking to us. In fact, the purpose of worship, the purpose of gathering together and hearing God's word is just that, to remind us that God is behind us. He's pursuing us. Well, in that ambulance, and with that siren, he relentlessly seeks after sinners, you and I. God wants us to see that picture through this beautiful story. Not so beautiful, but this amazing story. And not only in the Old Testament, but Jesus Christ himself confirms that that was his purpose, to pursue sinners. If you'll read with me Luke chapter 19, verse 10. I believe this is on the screen, right, Brother Faisal? Luke chapter 19, verse 10. There we go. Let's read it together. It's very short. Ready? Go. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. One more time. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, he came to this earth for one purpose, it says, to seek, to pursue, to find the lost. Not the righteous, not the healthy, not the wealthy, but those who are sinners, those who are hopelessly lost. We see that same heart of God in the Old Testament reflected in Jesus' heart. He's, he's proclaiming it with his life as he shared the gospel with his people. And only, not only that, as Jesus was teaching his people about God's burning heart for the sinners, we're reminded of Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son story, and before that, many other illustrations. But I want to point out this, this part of that story. Luke chapter 15, verse 8. Uh, can we have that on the screen as well and read it, perhaps? 15, 8. Okay, let's read it together. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? Jesus wanted some way to express his seeking his, his love and his, his searching for the lost. And he compares it to this woman who's lost this coin. If we lose a penny, oh, I lost a penny. No big deal. But this was not ordinary coin. It was a, a wedding diary, maybe. And so she is going to find it until she finds it. She's going to search until she finds it. Have you ever lost your wallet before? Maybe in a public place? What happens? You panic. Think about all the credit cards, your cash, your IDs. And uh, probably if you lost it in a public place, the, find, the po possibility of finding is probably close to 0%. It's been, it's been a couple of hours as well. But you still do every effort, make every effort to contact the authorities, try to see if there are cameras around, and pay whatever cost that's necessary to find your wallet or your purse. And Jesus is saying that, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He never gives up. Just like as we are we're relentless sinners, God is relentless in seeking and searching out the sinners. I pray that this becomes, this amazing truth becomes real in our hearts. It's not just head knowledge, but we see in our spiritual rear view mirrors, God pursuing even us, every one of us in this room, as he reminds us of his word. The application of this fact is very simple in the, Old Test in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Actually, as Sister Paula mentioned in their prayer, we need to draw near to God. The author of Hebrews says, since God is pursuing us, we need to draw near to God. What a beautiful command that is, that we can come closer to the one who pursues us, who is like an ambulance, who sees our bleeding spiritual devastation and destruction, and he is coming for us. 
And so the application is, let us draw near to God. This means that we need to value this time together of worship. You know, folks, it's so easy to miss the second Sunday after you miss the first Sunday. It gets more comfortable. We get more numb. We become more blind to the spiritual reality, what kind of state we are. But when we're reminded that how God is pursuing the sinners relentlessly, and we have the opportunity to go draw near to God, we can and we should. God's heart of pursuing is that He pursues us when we are sinners. Second, God pursues in relentless judgment. We read why. We can understand why God pursues the sinners. In the next part of the story, uh, we find this message. God had a message for Israel, the northern kingdom. And instead of speaking out, spelling it out, he puts the meaning in the names of Hosea's adulterous children. The first son they have, his name was Israel, Jezreel, right? Jezreel. And uh, wow, what does that mean? Why did, what would somebody name their son Jezreel? What does that mean? Well, if you look in the context here, in verse 4, uh, God gives the reason why he, he was uh, to call the son Jezreel. Like in the middle of verse 4, it says, I will punish the house, um, call his name Jezreel for in a little while, while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. When he's mentioning the house of Jehu, it was the reigning a dynasty right now, the king kingdom. It's a, a, a word that encompasses, that represents the entire Lord, the leadership, the, all the kings of, uh, uh, of um, northern Israel. He's saying, because of some wrongdoing in Jezreel, in the valley of Jezreel, this is the location, right? In the valley of Jezreel, something bad happened. You did something wrong, and I will avenge that wrongdoing in the valley of Jezreel, and the blood shall be upon the dynasty of Jehu upon the kingdom of Israel. What happened in Jezreel? Well, 100 years back, going back to Ahab time that we saw last month, you, we didn't go over the story, but you probably know the story of, of uh, Naboth. He had a vineyard, and Ahaz, uh, Ahab and Jezebel, they took it by force. And how they did it was they killed, they murdered the owner of the vineyard. And God is referring to that. I will revenge, I will avenge the blood, the un, uh, inju un, injustice that was done in the land. And I will uh, judge your family, your kingdom for this, your leadership. And so the word Jezreel meant, it, it signified the word, it was a synonymous for judgment of God for injustice. They had a second child. It was a daughter this time. In verse 6, she, uh, God says, Call this child no mercy. Ro, ruhama. Um, in some of your Bibles. In Hebrew, ruhama is, is mercy and, and grace. But ro means no. No mercy at all. And uh, God goes on to say, I will save. I will preserve the southern kingdom of Judah. But for you, no mercy. Northern Israel is done. And this child was to be called no mercy for that reason. Third child was a son. And the son's name should be not my people, Ro Ami. Right? Ro, again, is not. Ami is my people. He should be called not my people. This was a devastating judgment. This name was a, a horrible name. Because God was saying, you are not my people. I am not your God. Let's end it here. I've had enough. When we see the three names of the children of Hosea, the adulterous children of Hosea, we realize what the intention of God was. God's intention was very clear. It was, say, he was saying that God will judge northern Israel once for all. God was a relentless judge. He was coming as a judgment for Israel, and he would not stop until his work is done. If the first picture was a, a paramedic, an ambulance coming to pursue the sinner, the, the hurt, to save them. The second is also a uh, you know, siren. It is the policeman who is coming to stop you, to stop you from your drunkenness, stop you from your speeding, 
stop you from your reckless driving. It is the, uh, the, the form of the authoritative, authoritative policeman who is pulling northern Israel over and said, enough, stop, this is dangerous. Going back to chapter 2, once again, we find the direct um, heart of God why he's doing this. Verse, chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, I'll read it for us. Therefore, I will hedge up against, hedge up her way, uh, her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than, than, uh, than, than, than now. The apparent reason for this judgment was Israel's repentance, right? We see this per picture of this woman, adulterous woman, seeking after other men. She's pursuing other men, and God is pursuing her in order to stop her pursuit of, of idols. He is putting this hedge. He is putting this wall so that she would return to him. She would repent. She would see the... The, the depravity of those futileness of uh, futility of the idols and she'll find her satisfaction in the true husband. God goes so much as naming the sons and daughters daughter of Hosea uh, in judgment so that God could stop. He could help them repent of their sins. In the book of Hebrews it says that those he loves the son and daughter he loves, God disciplines. In fact, if there is no discipline in your life, you might want to think about, are, am I a Christian or not? God always disciplines those who he loves, who, especially those children. When something happens in our situations, in our life, and there is no apparent reason for it that you can understand, when there is trial, and when there's uh, roadblocks in your life, the first thing we need to do is look back into our rear view, rear view mirrors of our spiritual lives. Is there a, a policeman? Is there a spiritual siren going on coming after me and signaling me to stop? Brothers and sisters, as we understand that God pursues us to warn us and to even judge us, we are reminded that our response should be that we should always be humble enough to pray, to repent before our Lord. Why do we not repent? Why are we so bold time to time? I believe it is because we forget. We forget that God pursues us. We forget the high standard of God, the holiness of God. And we're so used to the standard of the world and we see ourselves, I guess I'm within normal boundaries here, socially accepted. We forget God, we forget his standards, we forget his love, his pursuit of us. Back in 1863, I am reminded of uh, a man of God. He was a president of the United States uh, in 1863. And you probably know him very well, uh, President Lincoln. He saw the state of his country and he reminded his people to pray. Just read portion of uh, what a speech, um, and uh, he, they legislated, le legislated in that time a national a day of of, uh, of fasting and prayer. After this speech, he says, "We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have preserved the many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown." But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hands which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly ima uh, imaged, uh, imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. I won't read the whole thing, but he goes on to say, let us go and pray for our national sins. And humble, and humble ourselves and ask God for God's forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, this is not just for a national scale prayer, right? As we are reminded of God who pursues us, we look back 
and we are reminded of God. And when we're reminded of God, we cannot but repent. I pray that all of us would have this soft heart to be able to remember God and pray each morning. That's the reason why we're doing quiet time together. Uh, in our bulletins, there is the reading for Philippians and Second John and Third John this coming week, this week. What is that for us? It's just a tool of remembering God, remembering God's word and reflecting our lives upon God's word. When God signals a siren, when he becomes a policeman saying, this is not right, this is not pleasing before me, this is not fitting of my son or daughter, I pray that our hearts will be soft in the morning, every morning, every evening, and say, God, I repent. I see you pursuing me even this morning. I repent. That was the intended message of Isaiah. But there's a third message of Isaiah, of God for us this morning. The third is this. God not only pursues the sinners, not God only, not only pursues in order to judge, third, God pursues in relentless love. In our verse, in chapter 1, verse 10, the first word is a very important word. Can you show us the verse once again? Oh, we don't have it on the screen this morning. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. 10 is a very important conjunction, contrastive conjunction. It says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea. Does that remind you of something? Sand of the sea, numerous as the stars, numerous as the dust of the land. God is remembering. He himself is reminding himself of the Abrahamic promise. Remember, that was when the first marriage happened between God and his people. God said to Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. You will be the fount of blessing. And I will love you unconditionally. I will make your people great. I will make you a blessing. And your sons, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, numerous of the stars. That's what God is reminding himself of. What a contrast of how God was going to bring this judgment upon the sinners. Now he changes tone suddenly and remembers the covenant of love that he had with Abraham, the uh, ancestor uh, to the kingdom of northern Israel. And uh, as a result of this covenant with God and his people, verse 10, uh, there's a sudden change in what the result will be. Uh, and in the place, in verse 10, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And goes on. Children of Judah who will be saved and children of Israel you will, be, you will be condemned, right? But it says here, children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together under one leadership, one appointed leader for themselves, one head. And they shall go up from the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Jezreel will be a place of salvation now. And I, I love this last verse, right? Uh, that we read, chapter 2, verse 1. Do we have those verses? Yeah. Oh, we do. Let's read it together one more time. Ready, go. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Before he was called no mercy. Before she was called not my people. Or the other way around. He was called, uh, not my people. She was called, no mercy. But now, you are my people. You are people who received God's mercy. How is this possible? How is this, this contrast, day and night contrast, how is this possible? The last part of this story, uh, we, re we want to uh, read in chapter 3, in fact. We're just going to pass to chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. God makes this extraordinary request once again to Hosea. You know, this woman, Gomer, was the wife, and uh, she has been in whoredom, she has been unfaithful, but look at what God tells Hosea to do. Verse 1, And the Lord said to me, uh, And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man. We find Gomer in the bosom of another man. He's telling, God is telling Hosea to go to her. An adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to their other gods and love cakes of raisins. What does God tell him to do? So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a, a lathe of barley. 
It's interesting, in those days, you know, in the Bible, you f- probably frequently remember that the cost of a slave was 30 shekels of silver. What was Gomer worth? She was worth a little over half of that price. You know, 15 shekels of silver, and then some barley. We can infer from this that she had fallen into whoredom, adulterous condition, situation, and she became a slave to someone. She was confined. She became a possession of this, uh, this idol, sin. And so, Hosea had to buy her back. Why would, would God allow Hosea to go through the experience? Hosea would, would, was to experience firsthand what it felt like from God's standpoint, how it hurt him, how it crushed him to see his bride, his Israel, suffer under this false idol and under sin. And God had to pay a price, just like Hosea. God had to pay a price for your sins and my sins. I we recall Jesus was sold to the soldiers for 30 shekels of silver, the price of a slave. And God had to pay the price of crucifying his son on the cross. And he went through the cross, death, and resurrection in order so that we may receive the freedom from death and sin and we shall be resurrected someday like Jesus Christ. And just like this verse says in chapter 2, verse 1, once who were not God's people, we were slaves to sin. Now we're called my people. We're called not no mercy, but people who receive God's mercy. We are recovered by the price of Jesus Christ. I pray this fact, this truth becomes a reality, a fresh reality in our life every day. That God pursues us in relentless love. He will not give up until we are found, until we are, our debts are repaid. And he paid it with his son, his son's life. The question I want to end with, on my sermon with is this, how shall we live? We've received this amazing love, this uh, payment of Jesus' life, lifeblood. And God has loved us relentlessly to, his, to the end, sacrificing everything and anything that he has, the Son Jesus Christ. How shall we live? The last verse I want to leave with, you, with us today is this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. There are many good verses in chapter 3, verse 16, but 1 John is one of them. John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16. And it tells us how we should live. Let's read this verse together, shall we? By this, we know that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Read one more time. By this, we know, love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. God is saying, if we experience, if we remember the relentless love that God has for us, isn't it, shouldn't we ought to? Love a brother, a sister with that same relentless love, even to the extent of laying down our lives for a brother or sister. That's pretty hard, right? That's that's a big sacrifice. But without going all that far of laying our life for somebody, I think the heart of God is this, that God came to pursue us with a relentless love, and we can express that relentless love toward another brother or sister who is lost. You know, uh, brothers and sisters, I find now and then uh, people who do inappropriate things at church. They, uh, you know, serve snacks after service, but they bring too much. You know, they should know that only like 10 people eat, but they bring like 30 people worth. Wow, how inappropriate, right? I ask them, why do you bring so much? And they say, you know, the children can eat, anybody can eat, anybody can have fellowship here. They are very inappropriate. They do it, they go over. I see people in our church once in a while that they over pray. Have you noticed people like that? You know, people used to say, usually say, pray, 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 but I see people who over pray. Usually you, pr- you come to church to pray for your sins, for your family needs, and your, for your work, for maybe for the government sometimes. But they, these people pray for another brother or sister who is in desperate need. They not only pray for their souls, but they pray for their families. They pray for their salvation. They overpray, inappropriately overpray. They also, I also find people who 
over invite. You know, when, when you send text messages or emails and invite people to church event, not everybody responds, right? Some people ignore you totally and you haven't seen them for many, many months. But some people over invite over and over and over again. And I am moved by people like that. If we think about our own salvation, wasn't it because somebody overloved you that you realized God's love is extraordinary? If we only thought logically, oh, God's love makes sense and I believe him. Where's the gospel? Where's the God in that? But I know every one of us was probably prayed by somebody, a mother, a mentor, or a friend who loved you enough to go the extra mile, to, to pursue you, to love you, to show what God's love is like. When you felt this extraordinary love for the first time, they're not even not my family members, not even my family members would love me like that, but once you experience that love, you experience the love of God. If that's the love, kind of love that God gives me, I will receive Jesus Christ in my life. As people who have received this extraordinary love, this love, the relentless love, First John, the Apostle John is commanding us, ought we not to love each other to the extent of Christ's love, with the relentless love? Brothers and sisters, my prayer for myself and for us is that this message would not just be another, oh, gospel message, God paid our, for the price for our sins, but if we truly understand God's heart this morning for Hosea, for us, that he is a pursuing God, pursuing us when we are sinners, can we also pursue another brother or sister who is dying, who is thirsty and hungry and doesn't even know that they need this Lord? I heard a beautiful confession this past week by a brother. He says, I realize, Pastor, that... Uh, Nothing in this world satisfies. You buy a new something, you get promoted somewhere, and it only lasts like a month or two, or maybe three. But I realized that only person that can satisfy is the light, living water of Jesus Christ. When I heard that, I heard the Holy Spirit speaking to me. I praised God for that amazing confession. Brothers and sisters, as we show this pursuing love, relentless love of Jesus Christ, to the people that God has given in your life. Maybe your children. Maybe your neighbor. Maybe your co-worker. They will not see you, but they will see the love of God that is the origination of, origination of your love. And they will give glory to God. Let us not be overrun by the sin and the idols of the world, but remember that God pursues us and let us pursue God together. Let's pray.